hitting the mark. I'm like, uh, you know, I think it's time to hit the mark in, in, in Christianity. I think it's time to, to actually walk in victory that we are talking about this year somewhat, and actually quite a bit. And, but we need to learn how to hit the mark, not miss it all the time. Like, I, I think we need to learn how to, you know, aim and the trajectory, right, and fire. And I think that we need to learn how to hunt <laughs> in, in, in the spiritual way the, and shoot the arrows that give life, the, shoot the gun that gives light, the, the only gun that probably doesn't harm people but gives them life, amen? And I think we need to start learning how to hit the mark because I think that we have seen our culture just miss the mark too much, and I want to hit the mark. I want to hit the goal that we have put before us. I want to I learn how to shoot, and I want to learn how to be accurate, and I want to learn how to follow that mark, amen? Because I think that will be the, p the piece that we need to be victorious in our individual families. I feel that I have three points today. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to become a teacher in the supernatural, you know, so I put three points together. But they don't make no sense. It's just three different messages, but... <laughs> but either way, we're going to see if I get the hang of that stuff. Number one, we're going to be talking about hitting the mark. Number one, there is life in the mark. When you hit a goal, when you hit a purpose, there's life in it. And we need to grab a hold of that life of what we're fighting for. We have to know that if I'm fighting for debt freedom, what kind of life is that going to give me when I get that financial blessing? That's the, my mark. If I'm looking for healing, what kind of life is that going to give me if I hit that mark of complete health? Right? What's that going to give me when I'm emotionally healthy, when I am physically healthy, when I'm mentally healthy? What is that going to give me, that mark that's going to give me life? That's the number one thing we have to remember. Life is in the mark. Life is in your goal. And so sometimes people say, it's about Jesus. Yeah, but Jesus is your goal. If you don't reach the goal, if you don't reach the purpose that you have, I don't think you have life. Would you agree? Would you agree that you're kind of down and out if you don't have a goal in life? Wouldn't you agree if you didn't have a thing to aim for in life, you would just kind of quit in life? So there's life in the mark. When we talked about last week about David and Goliath a little bit, and uh, I think it was last week, but anyway, we talked about David and Goliath. And um, <laughs> was it last week? Yeah, yeah? okay, good. I, I, I have so many messages going in my head right now, so I, I have to always wonder. But anyway, when we talked about David and Goliath, it, it, was, it was David, he hit the mark. He aimed and he took five stones and he made opportunity to miss, but he didn't miss, right? So he took it, the smooth stones, which created a trajectory, I believe, to fly smoothly in the air. And when, when we grab, grab a hold on the mark, we have to grab all the hold of the right tools to hit the mark. So when, when David hit the mark, he took it out of the river, which I believe is the life source. It took it out of the life source, and it brought it out of that place of smoothness, a place where it's not rough. It's already been worked over that tool. It's been worked over, and it's been functionally. And he's known how to use, and he's, he was a slinger in, as, as an armor. He was a... He was a he wasn't just a slingshot guy, because uh, we can all do that, and we probably wouldn't even hit the trajectory that we want. But he was a slinger. And as he moved the sling around, and the faster it went, the faster the trajectory is. And he'd done this all his life. This is what he was professionalized at, because he did that within the sheepfold, and so forth. And he, he removed it, and, and finally, when he released, he hit the mark. But with the mark, you have to understand you have to kill. When you hit the mark, you have to kill the enemy that was stopping you to get to the mark. And so when you, when you look at David, <laughs> and he walked into that place and he hit the mark, what did he do? You, actually, he went and he killed the enemy with his own tools. Everything that came against you became the glory of God at that moment. That sword that Goliath had was huge. It was big. He was about nine foot nine, according to the Bible. This guy was big. Eyesight maybe was bad, but he was big, and he had, had over hundreds of pounds of armor on there. There's no way that somebody could win him when it came down to the level of sword combat. So this guy really got, come to a point of, how do you kill an enemy? You first hit the mark, then you go use it against him that he used against you, and you kill him with it. So he took his own sword, the very sword that was supposed to kill the, the Israelites, killed a Goliath. Amen? So the very thing that has come against you in life is the very thing that's going to kill the enemy in life because God's glory is going to shine in that area in your life. Amen? And so we've got to walk in that place of saying, okay, I, I'm going to hit that mark so I can kill the enemy's authority. And so he took the head off. I mean, you don't, I don't ever hear kids, I, I've been in kids' ministry for many years, I just don't ever teach them how to cut a head off. Like this is really what happened is they cut the authority off. 
and the, the head was off, it was destroyed. And what happened after the mark is hit, after it's destroyed? Let's say if, you're, if your goal is to bring life out of a situation, and there's something giant in your way in your life, and there's something stopping you in life, and you finally kill it, what happens? All the little demons leave. The, it's easy to deliver because the whole army fled. All the other things that could have been a danger to them, when the authority is taken out in your life, when the stronghold is taken out of your life, all of a sudden, all those other little guys don't want to stick around no more because they have no life source no more. Amen? So sometimes we fight wrong. We, we, we fight with the things that we think we can handle. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm just going to kill this little devil. You big one, stay there for a minute. And <laughs> in the meantime, that thing is still bugging you. And the Lord is calling us to hit the mark. I believe that there's life in the mark. Romans 5.21 Romans is a good book altogether. Paul talking about just greatness of Jesus and our salvation within it. Talking about how we are free from sin and all that kind of stuff. I, I love Romans because it just really brings us to the freedom of not living religiously. But in the meantime, uh, most religious people say, ignore Paul. Don't talk to him as much. You know? But because he was a radical dude, man. And he was a guy that wanted to bring freedom to the people and bring the grace of God into the people. Amen? Are you guys with me? Yeah. Verse 21. So that just as sin reigned in death, we also... So, I'm sorry, I'll just do that again. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness, through the eternal life of Jesus Christ our Lord. As sin reigned in death. See, the sin is this place where Pastor Kelly talked about it, and that's why I, I had to actually postpone this message for because of the storm. I had to postpone this message. Because I had this message going, and I wanted to only preach it after Pastor Kelly preached her message because I felt it would flow with it. Uh, and so the thing is, we've been talking about sin a little bit to understand sin a little bit. Sometimes we, 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 when we say sin, we, we right away put guilt and condemnation into it, and, and we put sin into a place where it doesn't belong. We give it way too much glory. We give it way too much rights. And so we need to walk in that place of what sin looks like. But what grace looks like it too. And so what the word sin here is to miss or to have without a share. And sometimes when we miss the mark, is that's what a sinful nature is really recognized as of the Bible, is when we miss the mark where we don't have the share in his blessing no more. When we don't flow under the mark or the goal that he has for us, where we move off of it because that is a part of sinful nature, is that we walk off of it. It's when we, without a share, it's like when we don't have partnership with God's blessing no more. It also means to, to be mistaken. Sometimes sin is, is, is an innocent thing because it's created sin is because we're mistaken with something and we repent of our mistake. Wouldn't you agree? Would you not agree? So sin is not always willfully done, but it's also because we are mistaken in what we have done, right? And so when we grab a hold of that, so when the world says sin, everybody gets offended. But really, you shouldn't be offended. You should be thankful that it's just a saying that you missed the mark, that you need to get back on the mark. So it's not really always a con condemning word, but it's a recognizing word of saying, I need to get back on track. And so when the word sin is that you are mistaken or you, 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 are too, um, you wander from the path of righteousness or you wander from uh, honor, you wander from that place. What a sinful nature does is often because we can't see our mark and we often become fleshly and we do what comes naturally to us. And so we miss the mark, and we also get off the path of righteousness, and we also get off of the path of honor, and we forget that we went off of that, and we need to get back on that. And so that's what our, what our, when we prefer to sin. And it does outright say sin also means things that you do, like getting drunk and all those drunkenness and all that kind of stuff. It does mean that too, but a lot of times sin doesn't entail that. There's a lot of good people in this world, wouldn't you agree? And they do a lot of good things. They, they don't mean they always hit the mark, though. It means they're not following Jesus necessarily. But they're good people. Does that make them sinful? Yeah, it makes it that they missed the mark, right? It doesn't make them a person of guilt or condemnation necessarily, but it's a place where they need to repent and get back on the mark and get back on the direction that Jesus has called them to be. So when we feel guilty, it's because we feel guilty because we feel we've done something so bad that we became into the violation of what God is, and sometimes we don't even feel like we can go back to it because we feel we violated it. But the fact is we just missed the mark. We went off the direction that God has called for us to be at. Yes, sin is not a good thing. Sin is something you need to repent of, but you need to understand that it's easy always to get back on track. You can always go back on track. You can always get back 
where you came from or get back where God has called you to be from. Amen? So we need to get into that place. It's also a place to um, uh, violate God's law. Sometimes a sinful nature is this simply because we choose not to believe his blessings or choose not to believe his promises. So when we don't, when we miss the mark, there's no life. But when we hit the mark, there's life. And so when the fact is that the people come and, and we do these things and we don't get back onto the mark, we actually violate what God has. So we start not believing God heals no more. We start believing that God is not our Savior no more. We start believing there's more than one way or any of those things. It actually is missing the mark and it's violating God's law. It's violating who He is in us. Now, I'm not going to talk about sin. Oh, this is probably my f only part I'm going to be talking about sin about. I just want to bring an understanding of this because of what, what this hitting the mark is actually a big blessing that we have in our life today that we can move into a whole new direction and we can walk free and walk in victory. I want to learn that we, instead of focusing on sin, I want to focus on the battle. I want to focus on, uh, instead of missing the mark, I want to hit the mark even if I have to fight through it. Even if I have to break walls down, even whatever I have to do, I want to hit that mark because there's life in it. When you look at uh, Joshua, when he broke the walls, when the walls came down, they had life in it. They had the promised land right after that. When you look at any of these stories of David and Goliath, there's life after that. David became very recognized. His name became famous around there. And there became jealousy among all that. But his name, when you do something for God, when you do something great, your name will go out there. And your name will be recognized as that person that has done something. Later on in the story, they wanted to fight something. Uh, and if you read in, in the, uh, David, uh, about David, and uh, you look at uh, what he did, he went to the place, and the only thing they had there was the remembrance of that sword that Goliath carried. And so what David did is he took the sword of Goliath and he fought with it later on. And so sometimes the very thing, the only thing you can win life with is what you've been through with. And so when you look at what he did, he took that sword, what the victory he had. He took that circumstance, he took that thing that went against you, and he took it for God's glory, and he won the battle. And you can read that through the book there if you want to. But it's, it's that fact of taking back what the enemy has stolen. It's a fact that I can take this because I, I, I won that. Because you are remembered where your victories will always come back to you so you can win your next victories, okay? Your victories will always come back to you so you can win your next victory. So look back. If you don't know how to win now, look back at your victory and grab a hold of that tool that you won. And you can grab a hold of that sword that you won with or, or that sling or whatever you won it with and you can choose to win it with it today. Because if you could do it back there, you can do it today. If you were free yesterday, you can be free today. If you were free two weeks ago, you can be free today. If you were free three years ago, you can be free today. You've got to choose to be free. Amen? You've got to walk in that place of saying, I choose to hit the mark. I choose to enter into that. And then it goes on and says, grace might reign through righteousness into eternal life. Grace is this, and I want to bring this forth, just the two differences there, because it's important to understand to hit the mark. Grace is the merciful kindness of which God is exhorting by his holy influence upon souls, turns them to the Christ and keeps them strengthened, increases them in Christian faith, knowledge, affection, kindness, and exercise through Christian virtues. So grace is a place where you actually have mercifulness. You have the ability to enter into the mark. You have the ability to do things in powerful ways. You have the ability to be what God has called you to be. Grace is a powerful thing, but it's also a misused tool. Just like sin is a powerful thing, it's misused, but also grace is misused. Grace is life, but as soon as you use it with sin, it's not life no more. It actually is double vision. That's my coming to my point too. If sin and grace don't blend, what we have been taught in the grace message sometimes that they blend. Sometimes we've been taught that greasy grace, that if you have grace of God, don't worry what you do because God's grace over you. But they do not blend. How can you blend when one is missing the mark and one is hitting the mark? How in the world can they go together when one brings you this way and one brings you this way? There's no way they can work together. Would you agree? So what does sin and grace do? It brings sin and grace together, when they blend together, it brings double vision. So what happens to people when they choose to think they have grace so they can, the grace to sin, the freedom to sin, what they do in their life as Christians, they bring the power of double vision. So what they're doing is they're seeing two things and they don't know the truth no more because they don't see clearly no more. They don't see this, they don't see this properly. So they're walking on the fence. 
So now you're trying to look here and you're walking straight because you're pulling this way and pulling that way because you think you have grace to do this. At the same time, you have to grab a hold of grace. So you're, you're actually double visioning yourself. And so why do we not see blessing in life? Why don't we see the power of God in our life? It's sometimes it's simply because we don't understand the power of grace and the freedom of sin. The mark. Hit the mark. Hit the mark. And when grace can hit the mark, it doesn't give you a license to sin. It gives you a license to live. It gives you a license to be free. It gives you that license to follow Jesus like never before. And so the grace and sin, number two, sin and grace don't blend, which brings double vision and the mark is missed. The mark is missed. I have dealt with many people and seen lives of people where this life goes on and they wonder why things are not working for them. They wonder why they don't get blessings. They wonder why the power is not there. They wonder why this is not there. They wonder, right? Why, God, didn't you financial bless me? I did this. But as soon as you have that, it's very hard to understand how God's blessing can come to you. And the fact is, the most cases, God's blessing is that you, you just don't see it because you're double vision. Have you ever tried to put Coke, gla Coke bottles on your, or any kind of glass in front of you and you're trying to see where you're going? You would have many accidents, wouldn't you? Well, as soon as your vision is blurred, there's something that uh, life is taken away from you. Wouldn't you agree? You have to... You have to create different senses if you can't see, but the fact is, in God's eyes, you can always see where to go. Amen? And so I believe it's very strong to understand <laughs> that you don't need double vision in your life, so you might as well remove the missing mark and hit in the mark instead. Amen? How many of you want to hit the mark today? I, I, I'm, we are a sinful nature. That's just the facts of life, right? The facts of life, humans miss the mark all the time. The fact, that's why we're not sinners. We just miss the mark. When you're born again, you're not a sinner. You're just a misser. <laughs> you, we, the, the, we have a different label when we're born again. Sin is still involved in our life, but we're just not a sinner no more. But we are somebody that gets misled. Wouldn't you agree? We're somebody that often misses the marks, and we sometimes make the wrong decisions in life. It is a sin. It's just that we are not willful sinners no more, right? And so we've got to walk back into that place and removing the guilt and condemnation from that and saying, I'm not going to be double vision no more. You know, if I'm double vision, I'm going to get some eye correction going on here. <laughs> I'm going to get some spiritual correction going on in my eyes. And so we need to walk in that place of understanding that God is that way. I love it. That grace will free you from double vision. But in Romans chapter 6, 1 to, it's right after that, um, chapter 5, and, but we're going to read that Romans chapter 6, 1 to 6. Romans chapter 6, 1 to 6. I love what this Paul said because it made me feel free when I read the scripture. How many of you want to feel free? How many of you want to stop thinking that you are a sinner? How many of you want to stop feeling guilty that you have sinned once in your life or twice? I don't want to feel guilty about that no more. What about you? I want to walk in the life and I want to have a vision and I want to hit the mark of what Christ Jesus has for me. Is it good? Romans chapter 6 verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And so Paul, these guys are asking him here and saying, so what should we do then? Should we just keep sinning so grace can increase? I think that's how we think sometimes. Oh yeah, God. I'm going to ask for repentance right after I'm doing this. Yeah. But I, my flesh feels compelled. <laughs> and I feel I'm okay with it because your grace will, will let me go later on. Here, you know, uh, Because we're going to have increase of grace. So we have to change our thinking a little bit because I think we all can think that way when we are feeling guilty of something or when we're involved in something that we know we shouldn't be. And I have to get myself into that place and you know what? It's not okay. Sin is not okay. And grace, and this guy said, so will grace abound? People think that grace will increase because you sin more. I have heard people before and they, I hear these big testimonies about how they've been drug dealers and Jesus saved them. And people feel guilty that they don't have that big story. People feel guilty saying, man, I have nothing really to share. I don't have a testimony to share, so I'm really nothing. You have the biggest testimony ever. You never fell into that. But we, don't, we ever th don't you ever hear that? People think that? And they said, they think because they sin more, their grace is bigger on those people. They think because that person has a bigger testimony that the glory is greater in their life. They, they have bigger ministries. They have bigger everything because of that. The only reason they have bigger ministries is because of the way we think. Just so you know, I've never been involved in that. I believe God is still using me. Amen? I've never been drunk in my life. I still believe God is using me. I don't have a bad story. 
I have a bad story around me, but I don't have a bad story. Amen? I, I have not abused, I've not been abused, I've not been all those things, but God has used me to help people in those situations. We have to choose to say, okay, that is the, that's the biggest thing that we can't. And then he goes on verse 2, he says, certainly not. I'll just read verse 1 and with verse 2. It says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Or the word abound means increase or grow great. So then verse 2 says, certainly not. We die to sin. How shall we live any longer in it? Like we've been saying that we've been going back to basics. I have no idea why we're going back to basics. But it really, it's not that basic after all, is it? <laughs> right? We, all of a sudden you read it and say, wow, God, this is talking to me. So that's not that basic after all. We need to talk about this stuff. We need to remind people about this stuff. And it says, certainly not. We died to sin. How shall we live in it any longer? So we now have the grace of God. If we died to sin, that means that we're not sinners no more. Don't get religious on me here. <laughs> we're not sinners no more. We're just disobedient people that Ren was talking about. We, we are children. What happens to children and fathers and parents? They, they, they're disobedient. And then we correct them with a spank sometimes. No, no, we don't do that, sorry. But we correct them sometimes, we fix them, and we, we ground them or put them in a corner sometimes, and whatever we do. But we do not. What happens is repentance usually happens if it's a good home, right? And people come back. The kids come back to the father and say, okay, I can do it your way for that season there at home. And that's the same way with Christ Jesus is that when we died to sin, we are part of the family of God. We're not part of the sinner's family no more. You need to be free from sin. You need to know, stop feeling that you're a sinner all the time. And you need to know that you are of Christ Jesus and that we might have sin around us, but we're not sinners no more. We might have sin interfering into life. We might have it sometimes even that we miss the mark in our life and we enter into sin, but it's not us no more, okay? Just because we do something doesn't make it you, okay? Just because you do something by accident or by addiction or whatever it may be, it doesn't make it you. you. But the guilt tries to make it you, tries to make it about you, tries to make you feel guilty about it. It says, certainly not. You, die, you, you shouldn't live it and no longer. Verse 3 says, or do you, or do you, uh, do you not know that as many of us that were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. Don't you know this? That when you were pickled into Christ Jesus, baptized is a, is a deep word of being pickled. It's a deep word of, of saying that you're, you, 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 you haven't changed who you are, but you changed who you are. You're still a cucumber, but you're now pickled. You're still a beet, but you're just pickled. Whatever you pickle, I'm George, but I'm just a pickled George. <laughs> You, you are whoever, you can say your own name, and you're just a pickled version of it. Right? You're not Larry no more. You're a pickle Larry now. But if you walk into that place of understanding that when this, he's saying, don't you realize the power of your baptism, the power of your change, don't you realize what it did to your life? It changed who you were. It changed the atmosphere of who you were. It changed the inside structure of who you were. It changed the juiciness of who you were. It changed everything of what you were, right? You had more flavor at that. You, you had more of everything after that. You're not no more bland. You are powerful and exciting now. There's something that's changed when you're baptized in the presence of Jesus Christ. There's something that is pickled. You are a total different person. You're not just flesh no more. Now you have that extra accent. You have the extra stuff in you. You have the extra stuff that makes flavor in the world, that makes peace in the world, that makes healing in the world, that brings deliverance in the world. You have that extra. Amen? So he says, as many as were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into death. And he says in verse 4, therefore we were buried with him through baptism and death, into death. How many know that you were buried? <laughs> you were actually buried with Christ Jesus. You don't exist no more. You're, you, you just exist in new version. <laughs> Not NIV, but new version. New person you exist in. And so you said you were buried in, into death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so shall we walk in newness of life. 
says we were buried. This word buried means that we were plunged underwater. This word buried means to be declared, to, to declare and put away old faith and put in new faith. It's to declare the old paths away and shining up the new paths in your way. That was buried in that place of Christ. It was pardoned from the past sins. You were buried. Your sins are buried. So it's not talking about you are totally buried, but everything that you were representing, everything that was a falsehood in your life, everything that was a sinful nature, everything that was missing the mark in your life was buried. Amen? That's what the buried means there. So that means that what would happen if everything I've ever, ever done and wrong in my life and everything that ever went wrong in my life, whatever was going crazy in my life, if that's all buried, what would that make me? A pretty new person, wouldn't you agree? I would also have a whole different insight of life. I would also have everything like, wow. I, I would just have a different focus. I would have a different everything. That's what this power of Jesus did to us when we walk into the place of saying, I'm not going to miss the mark no more, but I'm going to hit the mark. I'm going to choose to follow what Jesus has called me to follow. And then he says, you will walk. He says, and, and the Father is so that we should walk in newness. The word walk is to be occupied. Everybody say occupied. Yeah, let's, let's stay busy being new in Christ Jesus. Let's stay busy being passion for him. Let's stay busy being that place. Be occupied. That walk, make opportunities. Like Find use of your opportunities. Choose to utilize them when you have them. Choose to walk in the new part of who you are. And walk. A lot of people miss the mark is because when they see an opportunity, they, they see it as an impossible opportunity, so they stay where they are, so they miss the mark of the opportunity. But the fact is, if we would see that our God is about the impossible, not about the possible, okay? Our God is about the impossible, not the possible. So if you think you have to wait till it's possible, you're wrong. You'll never get the mark. Because you have to walk in the power of the impossible God, not the possible George Blatt, not the possible of your own name. But you have to choose to walk in the impossible to hit the mark. Amen? And so when we walk in that place, we walk an opportunity. I'm going to do things I've never done before. I'm going to start a ministry that everybody says I shouldn't start. I'm going to start the power of church. And we're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to start this. And everybody says, no, not a good idea. You're not going to be successful. But the fact is, when you just choose to take the opportunity, that's impossible. Things that don't look right to you, but look right in the eyes of God. Things that you can't grab a hold of, but look right in the eyes of God. Then you truly will see the power of Jesus Christ flow through you because you're walking in opportunity. The, new, the word newness there is a place of new state of life. It's the Holy Spirit places us and produces in a state of eternal life. So when we walk in the newness of Christ Jesus, when we walk in that place, it actually is the power of the Holy Spirit being revealed in us daily. It's becoming alive. It's becoming excited for Jesus. It's becoming in the power of His holiness. Amen? And so when we walk into new things, it's the Holy Spirit places us to produce a new state, which is the eternal life. To produce. How many want to produce? I have seen people become successful businessmen because of this. I've seen people become successful home people. I've seen success in every area of life when people choose to walk in new. In the life of new. The life of the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? And so when we walk in that place... We can walk in to produce. Verse 5 says this. After that, after he says that you will bear, you will also rise up and you just need to walk in the presence of newness. You need to walk into that. Verse 5 says, For if we have been planted together, now he's talking church here, as a church, he's talking as a church, and now if we have been planted, he says, Now if we have been planted, for if we have been planted, which means united together, in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Certainly. Everybody say certainly. That means for sure. You see, we give ourselves way too little credit. We give our God and ourselves way too little credit, and we don't understand what we can really do. We can do great things in Christ Jesus. Amen? So we are planted, we are united in this likeness of His death, but certainly we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection. We're going to rise up. In every circumstance, what would Jesus do? Jesus would rise up in it. And every sickness, what would Jesus do? He would heal it, right? And every place of demonic, what would he do? He would deliver it. You have to understand, we rise up in his likeness. We rise up in the power. How? Together. It says together. 
as a church because Jesus is the head and we became the church. We became the body of, his Christ, of Christ. And now we can walk together and unite ourselves together and we can walk in the power together and we can rise in the likeness of resurrection as a body of Christ. Because if we don't do it as a body of Christ, we can't have the fullness of Jesus. We can't have the fullness of resurrection if you don't have the full body involved. How many know that Jesus' hand didn't just rise up? Or his little finger? How many know his eyes didn't just open? His whole body rose. It was a representation. Church, rise up. Church, rise up because you are my body. Rise up, church. Rise up, church. Hit the mark, church. Focus, church. Whatever you want to call it, the body of Christ, church. Some people get offended by either one of them. It doesn't really matter. But the fact is, rise up, church. You know what I mean. You know my heart. Rise up, church. We can rise up in the power of his likeness, of his resurrection. Church, it's time to rise up and hit the mark. And become more like Jesus as a church, as a body of Christ. And we see the fullness of him. I love it. I love it. I love it. Verse 6 says, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, so that the body of sin may be, no, may be done and put away with. But, sorry, that we should be no longer serve sin. I love that. I'm just going to read that verse again because I think it's a powerful verse. Let's just grab a hold of it together. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified. Hmm. I'm a new George. What about you? Well, not a new George, but whatever. I'm a new person. What about you? My old man was crucified. Doing what Jesus did. This is surrender. Nails in the hand. And sometimes it feels that way, but I didn't get the actual ones. But we were crucified with Christ Jesus. We were surrendering ourselves to the fullness of that. And if I think about that, if I was, old man was crucified, I know Jesus didn't have fun, and I know I didn't have fun being crucified. I know that when I was dealing with my old junk, it wasn't fun always. I know when you deal with your old garbage, it's not always fun, but it had to be crucified, right? And being crucified doesn't feel good. It feels like somebody's mocking you sometimes. It feels like somebody's against you sometimes. It feels like everything goes wrong. Being crucified doesn't feel good. Would you agree? So the old man gets crucified. Ow! I don't want to give that up. Ow, that too! And you start hurting because these things are being cut off your life. They're being crucified. <laughs> then it says, with him. Like, Lord Jesus, I thank you that we were crucified with you. I thank God that I can get rid of my addictions. I thank God I can get rid of my issues. I thank God that I can crucify it. The biggest problem we have is people don't want to get rid of sin. They just feel guilty, so they have to pray for repentance after every sin. We need to get into the heart where everybody says, I do want to crucify my stuff. We've got to get into a part that says, I, I want to stop enjoying what I do because it's not right. I want to stop doing what I do just because I do. But I want to start having it in my heart saying, God, uh, give me the heart to hate it. Give me the heart to crucify it so that I can live, so I can hit the mark that you have called me to do. Give me the power just to say no. Give me the power to just not enjoy it no more. Because flesh is weak, and that's my third point. I hope we have a little bit of time today because they need more time back there anyway. You're good so far? You're good so far? Okay. Uh, I feel that the, 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 too many times when we try to help people, they don't want to quit. They just want help at the moment. They want to be forgiven at the moment so the guilt can leave them and the condemnation can leave them. But then they do that over every process, every sinful nature. It's again and again and again. You've got to learn to hate sin. You've got to lear learn to hit. I, I'm going to hate missing the mark. I don't want to miss the mark no more, God. I'm tired of trying to find my back way to the mark all the time. I'm tired of being pulled off the mark. I, I want to go back to the trail. I want to go back to the path of Jesus Christ. I want to go path, to the path of righteousness. Amen? Yeah. How many of you want to start hating that stuff that is not belonging to you? So the only way it can be crucified is to hate it. It's to become new in it. If it doesn't become new, it's just forgiveness at a moment. But you're just going to always going to be suffering in those moments. Amen? You don't want to suffer those moments. You want to actually move forward. He says it's no longer... So that your body of sin may be done away with. That you may no longer serve sin. As soon as something controls you, you're serving it. As soon as something controls you. It's so easy, which my next point will come across, it's so easy to go this way. 
And I can say that for sure. You can say that for sure, wouldn't you agree? It is so easy just to just do this for a while. It's so easy to say, put this on hold for a while, and I'll go do this for a while. I'm not even saying being an ugly sinner. I'm just saying missing the mark right now. I'm not saying something so stupid that it's so embarrassing. I'm talking about just missing the mark right now. It's sometimes so easy just to go slightly off of your call. It's so easy to go slight up off of what God has for you. It's so easy to just say, I'm going to come back to you, bless me, because your grace is efficient for me. You're right, it is, but you're going to start over every time. You're not going to grow in integrity. You're not going to grow in the place of fruit if you keep flowing this way. And we need to flow that way into the presence of his mark, of what he has called us to do. So he says, we don't no longer serve sin. Number three. My third message of the day. Walk in the Spirit. Flesh alone misses the mark. Walk in the Spirit. Flesh alone misses the mark. If you don't walk in the Spirit, if you just walk in flesh, you'll never hit the mark of Christ Jesus. You'll never hit the mark because how many of you know that Jesus said, I send you the Holy Spirit so you can do the things I do? How many of you know that? As soon as you remove the Spirit, you don't hit the mark no more. You don't do what Jesus does no more. No more. Galatians 5, 13 to 16. You have time for this one last statement here, right? Yeah, yeah everybody's fresh and ready to go. Hallelujah, yeah? Okay. Am I the only one? Well, I'm going to pretend everybody's excited right now just so I can keep preaching. Woo! Yeah. So number three, walk in the Spirit. So because flesh alone actually misses the mark. I have seen that so many times when people remove the power of the Spirit, the flesh misses the mark. And so let's look at where Galatians 5, 13 to 16. For you brothers are called. How many say you're called? You brothers are called. You sisters are called. You, the, the word brothers means fellowship. You church are called. And this word called means you are invited. You are called by name. I call on you by your name right now. For you are called to freedom. You are called to freedom. You are invited to be free. By your name, I'm calling your name. I, Mary, I call you to be free. I have to use a name that it's safe in the video here. Mary, I call you to be free. I call you by name to be free. You are invited to be living in freedom. You are invited for freedom. You are called. That's what the word call means. You're invited to stay free. I invite you to be free. It's your choice. It's an invitation. It's not a control. It's not a, co it's not a commandment right now. It's just saying, I invite you to be free. I called you to be free. I call you to freedom. Only not to use freedom for the opportunity of your flesh, but through the love to serve one another. I love that because a lot of times we are free and say, oh, I'm free, so I can do this, I can do that, hallelujah. I finally can get away with it because I'm free. I finally can go ahead and because I'm free, I can get away with it. No, you can't. Freedom is not there to do what you please. Freedom is to do what is right. And so when we walk into, I'm called to be free. Why am I called to be free? So that I can serve you. I can preach freely. So I can freely bring you a message of truth. I am called to be free to serve one another. You are called to be free to serve one another. I'm f my freedom is here so I can bring freedom to you. So I can bring freedom to you. My freedom is here so that you can be free. So you can be free. And you're free so you, I can be free. So we can all live in the freedom of Christ Jesus. Amen? So we are called to be free. But he says, don't use your freedom for flesh because you miss the mark when you use freedom for, fresh, for the flesh reasons. It's going over time, it looks like it, for some people. Well, but we're, we're going to run closely to the finish here. Verse 14. For all the law has fulfilled in one word, th that is this, that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. All law is fulfilled that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. Which that word love is agape, unconditional love is served. For one law is fulfilled as through Christ Jesus as agape love to send his own son to be crucified for us and to rise again. That's his love. That agape love, now we can be free once for all, forever. Amen? All law is fulfilled through that one love. Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law, but I can fulfill the law. When he said it was finished, he said it was finished. It meant it. He was finished. That law was fulfilled. It is finished. Now the new law, now the new power of the Spirit is in place. Amen? We can walk in that place of saying the law is fulfilled and the power of love, the agape love, is to love your neighbor as yourself. Why does he say that? Like, why can't I just love myself? Why my neighbor? I don't like my neighbor. I do. I'm just giving you an example. Like, come on. God, but the power of our freedom is so I can love my neighbor. It's because it's about body of Christ. It's about church. It's about the people together win together. Amen? 
That's what it's about. And verse 15 says, but if you bite, <laughs> I like that word, if you bite, this word bite is saying if you wound somebody's soul or you cut them liberally, like you cut into them and you slice into them and you slice into them and you just peel off of them. That's what this word bite means. It, it means if you bite or devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. How many of you want to be consumed by Christ Jesus, not by each other? I want to love each other, but I don't want to be consumed by it. I want to be consumed by him so I can give here. But the fact is, as soon as we start biting and devouring, as soon as we find fault in everybody, as soon as we hold grudges, we're missing the mark. We're missing the mark instantly. And what happens is what gives us a bitter taste, and we start coming against them, and we divide ourselves, and we run away from that situation. People divide churches, divide families because of that situation alone, because of the biting power. said, but we will consume one another. And I have seen it so much. The consuming power is this. The devouring power is this. If I'd done something wrong and I slice into them and they slice into me, what happens is that always one person, when you are in the debate of biting and devouring, the person always has to pick themselves above each other. Guess what? More slicing to do that. More slicing to do that. More slicing to do that. Because that person cannot be the one in fault because they are in the place of biting right now. And when you're in a place of biting, even if this person did a simple thing wrong, they will focus on that simple so that their, that their big issue is not focused on. So that becomes a big issue. That's the biting power. That's the devouring power. And all of a sudden, this will rise up, and they will go back to that person, and go back to that person. And all of a sudden, you have this big thing that just totally misses the mark, and your life is totally focused around people and biting people. And we've got to get back to the mark. Get back to what God has called us and forgive those people because those lives have to move on. Verse 16, I say then, walk, be occupied in the Spirit, and you shall by no means be fulfilled in the lust of flesh. How many of you want to get rid of the lust of the flesh? How many of you want to get rid of that place of saying, I am... Do you have your music together at all, Any? Yeah, if you want to get to the piano, that'd be great. Get the piano going. And so if, if led by the Spirit, it removes the fleshly thing out of me. Huh? If you have a problem of addiction, you have a problem of any sort, spiritually or any kind of problem at all, if you have any problem at all, if you walk by the Spirit, it removes the fleshly. See, the thing is that if you are addicted, and, and a lot of people suffer with addiction, could go a broad way, so don't try to assume something, but it could be a broad. But if we just choose to be healed of that and choose to be followed by the Spirit, it will remove the desire of the flesh. And that will make our mark hit straight on. So as soon as there's a problem that we have fleshly, that means we're not focused spiritually too much. It means we need to focus spiritually. As soon as there's a fleshly problem, that means we have to tune in spiritually. Yes, you might need deliverance once in a while. You need to flow for that. And so as we go play this music, goes playing here, let's just receive prayer today. Is there somebody here that just says, I need to let go of bitterness today? And maybe you don't want to raise your hand, but you just want to let go of bitterness. And you just want to forgive people. And you want to, you want to get back onto the path and back onto the mark of victory. Back to where you belong, where you are successful. That's, you know, let's pray for that. In Jesus' name right now, Lord, I just release every bitterness and every sour taste in the mouth of people, of people being bitter or being hurt or being bitten at or devoured by or consumed by problems around them, Lord. Lord, we release that right now in Jesus' mighty name. I release that right now in the name of Jesus. I release the power of the bite of the enemy, the power of the snake to be removed right now in Jesus' mighty name. 